Thanks, and, Eve. And, and it might work best for people to put their um, Zoom on to speak of you so that they can see Karen in um, in full glory, as it were, or full screen. And, and also, the, and I think Karen's got some slides to show, so you'll be able to see them as well. Over to you, Karen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Katie. And uh, it is really lovely to be here tonight. Um, it's particularly lovely to be with people. I think it's such a fairly grim time. Uh, so I'm just looking around, looking at all your faces, thinking this is, this is, uh, this is a, a reassuring place to be. Um, I also wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, and also the traditional owners of the localities in which my research has taken place. And I, I do pay my sincere respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm hoping you can all see that. In my paper tonight, I want to introduce you to Joan. And this is a photo of Joan taken on her family's wheat and sheep farm at Berrywillick in the Victorian Mallee. In January 1958, her image featured in almost all the, the Melbourne major newspapers. And as you can see uh, in this image, it was also used as a promotional poster for the Royal Melbourne Show. Now this photo was taken after Joan had won the Commonwealth Bank Travelling Scholarship for young farmers to the United States. And it was the very first time a woman had won this award. So why was Joan chosen as a recipient of this scholarship and also as the official face of the 1958 Royal Show? What image of ideal rural womanhood was she seen to represent? And what might her experience tell us about how ideas of rural femininity might have been shifting and changing at this time? So Joan's experience is the focus of my paper tonight, but, and it's based on a number of oral history interviews that Joan and I conducted together. But the, bro the broader context is the abundant rainfall that characterised the decade of the 1950s throughout southeastern Australia. The Mallee, where Joan grew up, is a region in the northwest corner of Victoria, um, often known for its drought and unreliable rainfall. But during the 1950s, even in the Mallee, there was water in abundance. Above average rainfall coincided with high prices for wheat and wool and, and a raft of scientific advances. Uh, there's huge government investment in agricultural research, expansion of uh, government research stations, there was new wheat breeds, new farming methods, improved pastures. Country people tend to look back on this period as a golden age. Joan's early years were shaped by the parched years that became known as the World War II drought, but in the late 1940s, she gained a scholarship. Is that okay? Can people hear that sort of crackling? Yes. Um, I'll keep going. She gained a scholarship to attend a Melbourne boarding school. When she matriculated in 1953, she was offered a tertiary scholarship, but in the end, she declined that scholarship in favour of returning to the family farm. And it's really clear in our interview how much she was influenced by the atmosphere of the atmosphere of vigour and growth that had, had really overtaken the Mallee at that time after four years of bumper harvest. So Joan helped her mother in the house, um, although some of that domestic labour was being streamlined at this time by the arrival of electricity um, expanding through country areas at, at this time. But Joan also worked outside on the farm. She drove the tractor and the truck, she chipped weeds, she yarded sheep, she tailed lambs. Joan's older brother, Max, was also employed on the farm, but during the mid 1950s, he was away for months um, at a time on uh, fulfilling his national service duties. And in his absence, Joan became the chief tractor driver. <laughs> 
So, so Joan's labour outdoors meant she experienced at first hand the, the, the sensory dimensions of these wet years. The smell of moist soil, the clammy touch of damp clothes, the drum of rain, the joy of absolute joy of full tanks. And above everything else, perhaps there was the greenness. Um, people described this very eloquently to me as like a balm to the eyes after all the, the dust and the dryness and glare of the drought years. In our interview, Joan talked about it like this. She said, after the rain, the green would come up the next day and there would be just this green shooting everywhere. Just the way that everything comes to life, the green. And green, it's continued to be my favorite color because of that. So surrounded by all this rampant growth, it was very easy for rural dwellers to believe that, that advances in modern agriculture were indeed bringing to fruition this this greener, this flourishing, this, this prosperous future. During this period, there was also a strong emphasis on rural youth who were seen to be more progressive than their stick in the mud parents. They were the ones who would embrace and carry forward the torch of modern agriculture. While young male farmers were the chief focus of this vision, there was this growing perception that young women too might be called upon to advance a nation's modernist agenda. And in Victoria, this was very much epitomised in the Young Farmers Club movement, uh, a movement which was reconstituted in 1952 under the guidance of the Department of Agriculture. Um, and I have to say during the 1950s, membership was absolutely skyrocketing. Uh, as it was actually in similar organisations in, 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 in other states and also in the UK and the US. In uh, Berry Willick, a Young Farmers Club was formed in 1953 and rapidly became a, a dynamic social hub. It pulled almost every district young person into its orbit. Joan, not surprisingly, joined straight away and became deeply immersed in its activities. Uh, taking on the roles of, of not just uh, treasurer, but also secretary. And it's clear from my interviews and the club minutes that other young women were also reveling in the membership of young farmers. Several like Joan also worked on their family farm. Women took on the role of office bearers. They were right in there helping um, establish the club's experiment, experimental trials of wheat and pastures. They initiated a local field day and they organized working bees. And through all this, they were in contact with the Mallee Research Station, which acted as an advisor to the club. Joan told me they were all convinced that they and the club had an important part to play in, quote, the advancement of farming in our district. I'll just show you a photo. There's a, there's a photo of some of the, the young women who were part of the um, Young Farmers Club at Berry Willie. So this very same theme was evident in special courses for women that were introduced by the Department of Agriculture um, at its campus in Dookie in northeastern Victoria in 1951. These courses included training in tra traditional domestic skills like uh, dressmaking and uh, fruit preserving. But added to the syllabus were also lectures um, on the quote modern methods of sheep farming, dairy farming, machine operation, bookkeeping, as well as, uh, interestingly, meeting procedure and current affairs. So, so there was this message emerging that scientifically informed and knowledgeable young women had a role to play, not just indoors in the creation of model homes, but also outdoors in the creation of model farms. And, and of course, as many of you, uh, of you will know, the involvement of women in outdoor farm labour was, was not at all new. What was new was the willingness to, to recognise and to promote it. Uh, earlier images of female settlers had depicted them as pioneers, braving a harsh environment alongside their menfolk. Such images, however, were often accompanied by anxieties that the harshness of the Australian environment would, would rob women of their femininity. It would sap their womanly vitality and their ability to have children. And, and Henry Lawson, I think, uh, really explores this anxiety in well in many of his, his short stories. He talks about them as a group, um, as the haggard women. 
So by the early 20th century, as Kate Murphy has argued, images of the bronze pioneer women, woman had changed to this more domestic maternal figure who worked quite contentedly within the protective confines of the farmyard. Although she might tend poultry and milk cows, labour in the fields was beyond her purview. And this shift in imagery was significant at a time when the future of the nation was seen to lie in rural settlement. Persuading women of the attractions of country life, it was believed, would stem population drift, rescue women from the dangers of urban modernity, and preserve the white racial identity of Australia. Safely, safely insulated by her homemaker role from the wider environment, the rural woman was seen to occupy a different sphere from her husband. While his responsibility was to master the environment, hers was to domesticate and civilise it. So what I'm suggesting tonight is that the post-war period interrupted this narrative. And it, did, and it did that by specifically encouraging young women to lend their labour to the wider farm. This change rested partly on extreme labour shortages, shortages during the post-war period and, and the fact that during the war, um, the Women's Land Army had, had demonstrated the assistance women could provide. But at a, at a deeper level, I think, it built on new imaginings of the farm environment. While previous tropes had, had warned that close engagement with the elements would leave women unsexed, the greenness that characterised the post-war era made the landscape appear transformed. It was, it was no longer threatening, it was actively inviting women's engagement. Um, and in the, in the rather overblown language being used at the time, there was this sense of the invigorating winds, the winds of modernity had brought into being a new type of landscape. Images of drifting soil, skeletal sheep and sparse crops were now buried under swathes of green pastures and crops. The monotony and monotones of dust and drought had been suffused by viridescence and the environment that was now, and the environment was now pliable, acquiescent and entirely amenable to control. And the same message I, I think is, is tied up to that image of Joan that I began with. I'm just going to go back. Joan is shown seated on the farm tractor in, a, in itself, the tractor very much the quintessential symbol of rural progress at this time. And, and Joan herself representing an idealised view of the modern country girl. She's vigorous and confident, her eyes are looking to the horizon, while, her, while she's, she's boldly steering the tractor you know, and perhaps modernity into a very bright and green future. And she's also unquestionably feminine. She's young, natural, smooth skinned, at work in an environment that poses no threat to her womanhood. This is a farm environment, modernised and mechanised, now being presented as a place where white women can flourish. And the choice of this image was actually quite deliberate. Uh, the press reporter who visited Joan took other photographs, uh, which very fortunately Joan has, has kept and shared with me. Uh, the first one shows Joan cuddling two lambs. Uh, here's another one where uh, Joan is uh, delivering thermos tea for her father and brother in the paddock. And, and the third depicts Joan playing the flute while her, her mother sits at the piano. Um, and, and of course, as, as you will see, these images hark back to the domestic maternal woman, that, that figure largely confined to the farmhouse where she disseminated domestic comfort and civilised values, only venturing into the paddocks as a carrier of food and drink. And I think it's really interesting um, that that these images were discarded and, and it was the photograph of Joan on the tractor that was chosen. Uh, and it seems to really clearly show this new vision of rural womanhood that was being promulgated. And yet, uh, and I'm sure you're probably expecting a, a qualification, <laughs> the expanded role that Joan and other young rural women imagined and, and it was really being sold to them in the language and images of equality and opportunity, 
was often more limited and, and remained more entwined with traditional views of femininity than the, the promise they initially seemed to hold out. Just as the modernist of gender purported to offer control over the natural environment, the modern young woman was also envisaged as amenable to guidance, direction and training. And I think this point is made beautifully in a poem that appeared in the Sea Lake Times, um, which was written about this time to celebrate Joan's success by a, a, an unknown writer. And I've just extracted two, two stanzas, which I'll read. So it's entitled The Mally Girl. As mother, wife or daughter, her equal's hard to find in work, in art, in music, in all things most refined, fearless in the meeting house, fear, fairest in the ball, embodiment of gracefulness at a concert or a ball. Whether with bridle reins in her hand or on a tractor seat, in the running of a model farm, her training is complete. And now arrives Joan Carbot, the very well at Pearl, to show that brains and brawn combine in Australia's Mallee Girl. So the subtext of this grand eulogising was that the duty of women continued to lie in being a quote mother, wife or daughter in a support role to farming men. There was an assumption, assumption that like the model farm to which they contributed, young rural women would advance the cause of modern agriculture in concert with a man and, and preferably I think a husband. To this end, young women possessed a duty to remain well-groomed and attractive, um, you know, that, that embodiment of gracefulness in the, in the poem. And Joan's own life reflects this complexity. After winning the scholarship, she, she did spend very four very four months visiting farms in the, in the United States. But soon after she returned home, she became engaged uh, and then married a farmer from the Wimmera. And as Joan found herself transplanted from the Mallee environment she'd known so well into an unfamiliar landscape, her life changed. She faced the intricate dynamics of a fourth generation farm and powerful expect expectations surrounding her domestic role, especially after she had children. And, and Joan, like many other women uh, I interviewed, were, was reticent about discussing this transition. And feminist scholars, of course, have used the term invisible farmer and identified just how deeply embedded, embedded gender identities, identities often are in the institution of the family farm and very difficult to escape. Despite this, by the 1980s, Joan had become an influential community leader. She spearheaded land and soil conservation programs. And she was part of this uh, sort of upsurge of rural activism in the 80s that, that later became part of the Australian rural women's movement. Joan is in her 80s now and uh, rarely visits Amalie. But this chapter in her life, as, as I've demonstrated tonight, still has enormous potency. It was a time when plentiful rainfall reinvigorated plant, animal and human life, and for a while at least allowed habitual expectations to loosen their grip. Nevertheless, this real, this real tension and struggle between emerging new ideals of rural femininity and young women's real life experience continued and was not easily resolved. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much for that fabulous, subtle um, exploration of Joan and the green years in the Mallee. Um, really beautifully done. I think we might take just a few questions now for Karen and then we'll have Sandro and, and then we'll have some joint questions after, um, after his paper as well. So just a, a couple of questions maybe now, if anyone has them, you can either put your um, uh, hand up on the screen or use the participants hand up function um, if I don't see you waving at me. Would anyone like to jump in and ask a question? You've wowed us all, Karen. 
Yes, Liz. Oh, yes. Um, thanks, Karen. That was lovely. Um, I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts about um, the her Wimmera experience, whether the environment, what the environmental conditions when she started farming in the Wimmera, did, how that affected um, her impressions of her life and did she continue to have invoke the environment and in in her feelings about her personal life or her family life? Uh, yeah, thanks, Liz. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, it really featured much more than I expected in my interview with Joan. Uh, her, she, she was, as I said, reluctant to talk about the details of her life after marriage, but she was very forthcoming in talking about the different soil that she encountered because uh, it's, it became a passion for her, particularly in her um, in the correspondence and her contact with the with scientists from the Mali Research Station, soil conservation became an absolute um, passion. And so, before she she moved from the Mali, she was uh, she was doing a lot of public speaking. Uh, she was very involved in soil conservation initiatives. So when she moved to the to the Wimmera, she encountered an entirely different soil. It was a a, a black soil. Uh, it repelled water. It wasn't sandy like the the soil of the Mallee. So she talked about that a lot as though it was somewhat symbolic of her, her change in circumstances. But the, this, this, uh, this, she said that the, the, the soil, the protection of the soil became embedded in her, that, that there was no, she had a sense that you couldn't do anything unless you looked after the soil. And so that really propelled her later on as her, her, as her children became older into uh, the Land Conservation Council and working to protect soil in the Wimmera, not actually in the Mallee, but in the Wimmera, uh, and, and recognising that that soil was also fragile in its own way and needed protection. So she carried that with her even into a very different context. Thank you. So there's a couple of questions in the chat um, from Sonia. Did Joan compare herself with her mother in relation to life on the farm? Uh, yes, a, yes, she did a lot. I think uh, one of the really rich things about oral history that it's hard to convey in a, in a short paper is is uh, th those sorts of reflections. And and Joan Joan's mother very much was you know the domestic maternal uh, more traditional image of, of the woman that that was uh, whose labour was more confined to the farmhouse. There's a lovely lovely story that Joan told me about uh, going to the field day, the Mallee Research Station run by the government had a, a large field day once a, a year. And the scientists, the agronomists at the field day would, would um, present the findings, the, the, the people who attended it would be attended by up to 500 farmers and they would follow the scientists from experimental plot to experimental plot and the, the scientists would talk about the results of, of the trials. And Joan told me that she went to, along to this field day uh, with her brother and with her father and, and with a, a girlfriend. And her mother went too, but her mother went to, there's a, there's a section where they talked about gardening and um, yeah, gardening. And so her mother sort of ensconced herself in that area. And Joan spent the day uh, walking around and, and making notes. So for her, that, that was very, she never wanted to be like her mother. She, she, she told me that story to, highlight the fact that that was not where she saw herself going. Um, so, you know, interestingly, later on in her life, I think she felt um, th that in many ways, some of those ambitions to be very different from her mother hadn't been realised. Mm. So often is that case, isn't it? And one last question before we move on to Sandro um, from Denise Chapman. What specific areas did, she, did um, Joan visit in the US? So was she in the South or the North, the Midwest? And how did each space or place impact her? Oh, another fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the, the area that she visited was um, was the was Dakota and Ohio. So they were on the in the in the Great Plains area. Very in many ways, actually, many many parallels with the Mallee. So they had also had the the, the Dust Bowl experience in the in the nineteen thirties, uh, and Joan. She, she had an amazing trip, actually. She stayed on farms, she worked on farms, uh, she was taken out, she was hosted by the, the youth movement 
called 4-H in, in U, the US, which many of you may know. And uh, she came back very, very much feeling like America was ahead of Australia. She came back sort of inspired to, uh, and when she came back, she, she did, she did um, go on a sort of a speaking tour and visit community groups and farming groups and, and talk about her experiences in the US. So she was very inspired by what she saw in America and, and felt like this was something that uh, the cropping areas of Australia should emulate. Interestingly, in our interview, um, within 10, 20 years, she was seeing that, that form of industrial agriculture that she'd so admired when she visited um, America in terms of the proliferation of herbicides and the over-cultivation, as she saw it, the over-cultivation of the soil. When she joined the Land Conservation Council, she was actually campaigning against that, that um, uncritical embrace of industrial agriculture, which when she toured America, she was so um, full of praise for. So uh, she, she was also, she's a, she was a very reflective, she is a very reflective woman. So she herself said, I was totally caught up in, this was the way for the Mali, this, was, this is the way that we, we could um, guarantee a prosperous future. And then two decades later, she thought very differently. Thanks, Karen. The fabulous answers to those questions too. And we may, hopefully we'll have time for a few more questions at the end, but let's move now to Sandro. Uh, Alessandro Antonello is a senior, senior research fellow at Flinders University. He is the author of The Greening of Antarctica, Assembling an International Environment, and currently holds a much coveted Australian Research Council DECRA grant for a project titled An International Environmental History of the World Ocean, 1950s to 2000s. So this evening, however, he is going to be talking to us about Alice, Mary Alice McGuinney and the Antarctic Ocean and American Environments. Over to you, Sandro. Thanks, Katie. You can all hear me? Yep. Great. Um, hello, everyone from Adelaide. And I also want to um, respect to Ghana elders here in Adelaide. Adelaide sits on Ghana country. Um, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present here. Um, it looks to be quite cold in Melbourne. I see some of you quite rugged up there. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there. I wish I was there. My family is in Melbourne, friends, etc. And I really empathise with everyone there now, right now. Um, so I'm sending you all my love. But to Mary Alice McGuinney and the task at hand. Um, I think, so when Eve and Katie uh, uh, invited me, I think perhaps there are two reasons to uh, talk to the Feminist History Group today. First, as um, the title of my paper it makes apparent, I've been slowly and intermittently working on a biography of this interesting figure, the American krill biologist, Mary Alice McWinney. Uh, she was born in 1922 and died relatively young uh, of lung cancer in 1980. Uh, very much an interesting figure, certainly not a household name, um, but she's interesting because uh, she was the first US woman, um, American woman, to do research in Antarctica, probably only the second woman, um, the second sci uh, female scientist to work in Antarctica. She was the first woman to be a scientific leader at an, at an Antarctic base of any nation. And in general, her professional working life uh, overlaps a really interesting period in Antarctic history um, in, uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so she was a woman of firsts, but she was um, in a she she was a woman of firsts in an utterly masculinized region, um, the Antarctic, uh, and I think just in general her career um, is a great window into that period. My thinking on uh, McWinney is very much a work in progress, um, but I'm quite anxious to allow this project to be more than simply a biography of a working life, um, and I'm. Hopefully this has been a good opportunity to sort of suggest some concepts and issues I'm thinking about. But for me, of course, I think there's a tension with the work I'm trying to do, both in probing how nature and gender were co-constituted in Antarctica as a kind of um, substantive question for Antarctic and environmental history, um, but then the question of perhaps how to write a feminist history in this context, so the methodological question. Um, the second reason I'm talking to you um, so there's, sorry, there's Mary Alice. Um, you'll see a bit more of her. Um, 
The second reason I suppose I'm, I've been asked here is that um, with three colleagues in 2016, I published an article, Glaciers, Gender and Science, a Feminist Glaciology Framework for Global Environmental Change Research. Um, this article gained a little notoriety from several communities at the time, uh, including some minor coverage on Fox News. Um, this is when I worked in, at the University of Oregon in the United States. Um, tale of that furor is for another time, but um, what we tried to do in, that, in this article was to ask how we might understand glaciers and the cryosphere differently if we gave attention to and respected varied experiences and knowledges of that ice. Um, we took a fairly standard range of conceptual concerns from contemporary scientific technology studies, especially but not only feminist STS, um, to challenge portrayals of ice um, in both the popular media and the sort of larger multidisciplinary endeavour that is global environmental change research um, and such bodies as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so we were really asking what do we, um, how do we get to this point where we see ice as just ice? Um, and part of the point of our article um, was not um, only to pay attention to hitherto unstudied or understudied women, but was of course to argue that a feminist standpoint brings a range of intellectual and conceptual challenges with it. So I'm just briefly mentioning this, uh, especially feminist glaciology as a way of perhaps just saying the kind of work I've done. First, that I'm an environmental historian, um, particularly interested in the ways that modern Western science is the dominant way of seeing and knowing environments today. Indeed, this entity we call the single earth or global environment. And my work has really been on Antarctica, but as Katie mentioned, moving into oceans. Secondly, a lot of my conceptual concerns have been taken from um, various elements of critical human geography research, um, not just historical geography, but critical geopolitics too. Um, so this means in, in some ways, my work often can conflate, not uncritically, but can conflate space and territory with environment and, and nature as such. Um, and especially in my work in Antarctica, territory is this really a multivalent concept in which um, it's both a natural, cultural and a historical thing. And I should really mention the specific context of Antarctic research I work in, which is a, a, an interesting mix and tension of intellectual and geopolitical. So with colleagues, you know, we're trying to build a broader humanities and social science for and, for and from Antarctica. Um, in that context, gender is very often about masculinity. Um, you know, this is still a continent dominated by the work of men. Um, historically, um, is dominated by men in many ways. And, um, you know, just to put it most bluntly, until the 1960s, there were essentially um, no women worked in, um, in Antarctica at scientific bases. Um, it was not until the 1970s that some countries even allowed women to spend summers there, let alone winter. And I mean, just as the most ridiculous sort of aspect of this history is that Britain, the United Kingdom, didn't even let women spend winter in Antarctica at their bases until the 1990s. So this is really the, um, uh, you know, the highly masculinized space. Um, and so that means that there's still a, a strong uh, element, especially in science, social scientific research for Antarctica about thinking about how to bring women just literally into Antarctic scientific structures, let alone in larger discursive or other ways. All right, let's give a bit of, oh, there's Antarctica. Um, uh, uh, I should have put this in more slides, but um, the areas I'm, Mary Alice worked in the oceans around Antarctica um, and she worked at McMurdo Station. I don't suppose you can see my cursor. Um, McMurdo Station is sort of right in the middle of the picture there near the Ross Ice Shelf. And she also worked at Palmer Station, which is in the sort of top left hand corner near South America um, at the top part of the Antarctic Peninsula there. All right, um, so Mary Alice McWinnie, uh, born in Chicago in Illinois in the United States in 1922. Uh, I don't know too much about her early life, um, but it's possibly in keeping with my emphasis on her working career. 
Um, in the early to mid 1940s, she was an undergraduate and master's student at DePaul University, which is a major Catholic university in Chicago, in suburban Chicago. Uh, she graduated in 1952 with a PhD from Northwestern, um, which is also, well, they would say it's in Evanston, but it's in Chicago. Um, uh, and she received a PhD in uh, marine animal uh, physiology uh, on flatworms. Um, even though she, the PhD wasn't on crustaceans, after her PhD, she essentially spent her whole career working on crustaceans. Uh, in 1962, uh, she made her first trip to Antarctica um, on board this vessel in the middle of the Altanen. And so that made her the first woman to participate in the US Antarctic Research Program. Uh, she made 10 more visits to Antarctica, depending on how you count, but I think 10's right, or 11 trips in total, including other voyages on the Altanen. Um, now, the Altanen was a a sort of multidisciplinary floating laboratory. Um, uh, her work on it um, was principally to do with her work on krill. Uh, krill is uh, the sort of basis of the Antarctic ecosystem. It grows to, a, it's not microscopic like other plankton, it grows to about six centimeters. Uh, it's the largest animal species on earth by biomass, so it's total weight. Um, and you know, it's a completely, for me, it's a completely fascinating creature and she spent her life working on it. Um, so her first sort of 10 years in Antarctica was spent on the ocean, as it were, uh, on board the Altanen at various stages. Um, and in 1972, she also be, was the scientific leader on the Altanen. Um, at the, at the end of the 1960s, she, like many other scientists uh, in the United States, got, uh, especially environmental and biological scientists, got swept up in, you know, the general environmentalist changes of the period, Earth Day, um, this is after Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, the 19, 1970 itself is like a watershed year in, many, in major environmental legis pieces of, many major pieces of environmental legislation in the United States. And so she, um, because her physiological work was interested in how animals adapted to hot and cold, so temperature, uh, she weighed into um, the idea of thermal pollution in the Great Lakes uh, at major public workshops. So in fact, it's very interesting to read her testimony at these events, the way in which she's both contributing substantially on the question of thermal pollution and also really being articulate about what the role of a scientist is at the moment, you know, at this great ecological awakening of ecological consciousness. In 1974, she was appointed station scientific leader at McMurdo Station, which made her one, the first woman to lead um, a scientific station in Antarctica and two, the first woman uh, to spend winter or that we know of to spend winter in Antarctica. Um, she, uh, for various, perhaps, probably reasons one might anticipate, she, um, they didn't want to send her as the only woman to the McMurdo station surrounded by a hundred men in winter. So she went to Antarctica with a nun. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why they chose the nun. Um, and uh, I think, I gather that McWinnie was you know, a fairly devout Catholic, um, but I, I'm not sure that exactly that's why they chose the nun. Um, I can, I suppose now you're recording, so I won't say this um, anecdote because I debate whether to include it. But um, uh, McWinnie was a little censorious of the nun's behaviours during the winter, um, and I'll leave it at that. What I want to emphasise uh, by um, here is that I think this is an interesting way to think about what is environment. When we're talking about the constitution of gender and environment, what is environment? If you're locked inside an Antarctic station in winter, you're not, you're not, ro ro you know, you're not roaming around on the ice, you're staying very close to the station. And so I think when we look and pay careful attention to someone like McWinnie, and I think, and I'll get to this a bit uh, before I end, what does it mean to think, bring a gendered approach to environmental history? We question like, the question is where is the environment? So um, there's a way I think in which concentrating on McWinnie draws us down from like a general conception of Antarctica as one big ice sheet, one big ocean, 
and really makes us pay attention to how knowledge and sort of environmental sensibilities are, are developed in you know, close range of where the scientists and other workers actually live. Uh, she spent, after um, she spent the winter in 1974, um, in the late, the second half of the 1950s, she spent a lot of time in the Antarctic Peninsula aboard this very tiny ship called the Hero. Um, part, it has sails, but it was, it was, it, you know, it was powered by an engine. Um, and this is, uh, look, this is just a gratuitous tourist shot from me on the right. Um, I was in Antarctica in January and we happened to go past, um, not very close, so I didn't see the station, but we went past Anvers Island where Palmer Station is based. And so um, that little sort of bit of rock there in the middle left of the picture, on the other side of that is the station and you can see the Ma Ice Piedmont sort of gracefully ascending above it. Um, and so this, um, I was on a ship in the Bismarck Channel here, and this is the area in which um, Mary Alice was on um, the Hero doing work on krill in this area. All right, um, I'll just uh, sort of say a few things else, thing, other things about um, McWinnie. You know, an incredibly enthusiastic and energetic and charismatic person, you know, in a, in a sort of most obvious sense, she was, a woman trying to work within a, you know, a male dominated um, sphere. Uh, she went by, like, as we know, peer reviewed literature now says that, um, you know, people who go by their initials in publications are treated as men. So she went by M.A. McWinnie in her applications and publications. And there's a sort of classic document when a grant administrator first meets her and he writes in his note, I discovered that M.A. McWinnie was a woman. Um, which, you know, she sort of got them so far down the track of giving her money that they sort of had to make, let her go to Antarctica. Um, she was part of a larger moment of working and thinking about the oceans in the post-war decades. Um, she was trained within a university research system, rapidly growing during the Cold War when the US government, among others, was throwing bucket loads of money at science to help to understand the Earth environment. Um, and oceanography and ocean studies benefited immensely from this. And so McWinnie was absolutely part of this system. And I don't really see anything in her writings or her personal letters that suggests that which she was sort of um, feminizing these ideas of military domination of global space. I mean, she even sat on the US Navy's research board in the 1970s. So she was absolutely part of um, a militaristic uh, state sponsored approach to the global environment in the 1970s. It's a really wonderful book by an American historian, Gary Kroll, um, in which he explores different Americans and how they shape the public imagination with regard to America, America and the ocean. And there are really two really prominent women in the post-war years. One is Rachel Carson, you know, famously author of Silent Spring, um, who had early written The Sea Around Us. Um, um, for Gary Kroll, he sort of sees that Carson is portraying the ocean as an overwhelming um, presence, that humans are insignificant in its presence, and there's a sort of symbolic geography of humility. The other person um, Kroll talks about is Eugenia Clark, who sort of was famous for working and snorkeling with sharks. And for Kroll, Clark, in contrast, sort of makes the ocean into a home and sort of but in the, in the process is extending what he says is the Cold War cult of domesticity. I'm not exactly sure when uh, McGuinney sits on this kind of, in, with, within this kind of American ocean frontier framework, um, but I'm still trying to think about what um, that answer might be. Um, I'm gonna, I suppose I've, in the last few minutes, I'm just gonna sort of wrap up by trying to, think about how McWinnie and her story might help me and us think about gender and environment. I mean, um, where am I? I've really drawn a lot of influence from Donna Haraway's, you know, you know, groundbreaking article, still much cited from 1988 on situated knowledges. Haraway was intervening into science studies at the time. Um, and rather than searching for knowledge relativism, she's really looking for a stronger objectivity. And in this, she's famously argued Quote, I am arguing for the view from a body, always a complex, contradictory, structuring and structured body versus the view from a 
above, from nowhere, from simplicity. Only the God trick is forbidden. Um, so I think, you know, as a kind of methodological statement, I think it really justifies looking at someone like McWhinney, um, who is spending a lot of time in Antarctica over these 15 to 18 years um, and sort of cultivating a local conception of the Antarctic environment, a sort of multi-sided conception in her like personal correspondence with family and close colleagues. I'll also mention Elspeth Proben's work on oceans. Um, in her book, Eating the Ocean, she riffs on Stephen Helmreich, an anthropologist's idea that because the ocean is a strange environment that we must come at it athwart theory, which is a sort of suitably nautical expression. Um, sort of, look, I can't really give great justice to what he says because it's a bit el el elusive, um, but you know, coming at things sideways. Um, Proben interestingly adds, and I, uh, you know, I, I really like this about Proben's work. Uh, she interestingly adds that Eve Sedgwick's understanding of the word queer as meaning a cross, which itself derives from the Indo-European word that led to a thwart. Um, so a thwart, a cross and queer um, have these sort of overlapping meanings, which sort of perhaps call upon us in a sort of broader environmental humanities to sort of dwell in what um, Elspeth Proben calls these troubling eddies. Just two final points to end on. Um, one of the things that McGuinney and sort of concentrating on her as a state, you know, living in Antarctica in stations and on board ships, is that if we are called to reject the nature culture binary, I wonder if a feminist environmental history would call on us to sort of reject the inside, outside or the private public boundary, uh, binary, you know. Uh, I, you know, I think there are interesting ways in which, for example, labor history of um, environment, labor environmental history says that we need to attend to the environments in workplaces and how in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, unions are fighting for the quality of the work environment. Um, so for me, that, um, that we need to look at the bases and the stations of Antarctica to make us really see what the environment and the environmental history of Antarctica is. Um, I also think there's an interesting question about scaling here. Again, um, uh, there's sort of a recent trend from um, Deborah Cohen as one example in climate history about asking how do we get sort of big or global environments um, from local work? And so this is scaling. How do we scale up or down our ideas about the environment? Jen, um, and Cohen's work is about Austria-Hungary in a really interesting way in the 19th century about how that producing the territory of Austria-Hungary was tied to upscaling from climate ideas. Gender is a notably absent part, is quite notably absent in Cohen's analysis, but it does make me think about how at, at the various up and downscaling of environmental ideas, how in those moments we might see the, create, um, the constitution or reconstitution of gender. In Antarctica, the specific, my specific case is that Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty system which governs it tends to make us see that region as a whole. But how then should, um, and so if, if, if the sort of geopolitical situation wants us to see the region as a whole, does a sort of feminist history make us subvert that with more local histories of Antarctica um, and how that might I mean, dare I say, you know, democratize a fairly closed and secretive system. Um, and I'm going to end with the throwaway, throwaway line, which is to say that if we take a more post-humanist or a more than human approach, we could even ask, for example, how did the krill, how did the krill that McGuinney studied contribute and make McGuinney's life in a certain way? How did it constitute her? How did it con perhaps, how does krill in their actions constitute gender and environments. So I'll leave it there. Sandra, thank you very much. That was um, a fascinating and challenging discussion where you've raised all sorts of questions for us to think about and to discuss. Um, what, a f what a fabulous array and a fabulous pairing of papers. Um, let's have some questions now for Sandro um, and then we'll save and then we'll have some um, for either Karen or Sandro. Uh, so anyone can wave at me or 
put your hand up on the participants list or um, ask in the chat, whichever way works for you. And maybe while you're thinking, um, oh, okay, Carla, yep, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Sandra. That was really fascinating. And I'm um, still thinking about your question about krill at the end there. That was really, really wonderful. Um, I've got a, a totally uh, left field question, but it, I suppose it, it, this was coming into my mind as you were talking. Um, and I think you know that I did a little bit of work on the cultural history of menstruation a while ago. And um, one of the things that was interesting was um, seeing how menstruating bodies were treated in um, very masculinized spaces, like for example, in, in the army um, during World War II in Australia. I'm curious about what McWinnie, as a woman coming into a previously masculine space, um, it just strikes me that one of her challenges would have been menstruating in this space, both having products to menstruate with and to, um, pr I must, presumably they probably would have been disposable and then how she would have disposed of those products. Um, because I've, I mean, anyway, I've, I've read a lot of fascinating comment, uh, commentary between men in different contexts trying to work out how you deal with women's menstruating bodies. Um, have you found any evidence of how she had to manage her unruly female body or in this very masculine space? I've not seen her mention menstruation in her letters. Um, I should say that a lot of what I know about her thoughts come from sort of circular, not circular, like um, Xerox letters that she would type out, very long letters, descriptions that she would send to, I assume, just family and maybe some close colleagues called My Dear Everyone. That's how she opened them. Um, so I've never seen her talk about menstruation. I know I have a colleague um, doing, finishing her PhD at Cambridge who's working very intensely on these questions. So I, I, she's talked about other women explicitly mentioning menstruation. But... Um, in what I see the men talking about, those who control the spaces, they are, um, they, are, they are interested in sort of toilet matters, like where will the women go to the toilet is kind of their pressing question um, when it comes to Antarctica. Um, and the, the answer to that question is quite different sort of in the 70s and 80s versus now, or you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, because um, there's a change in the early 90s where all human things have to be transported off the continent. So you can't leave any traces, which includes, um, uh, you know, human waste. Um, and so then, uh, you know, thinking about how women will have to wear clothes and, you know, do basic urination and defecation in the field. Um, but yes, the men I've seen generally are obsessed with talking about where will the women go to the toilet. Um, but again, I suppose, you know, just to tie it back is that this should, I think, call, make us think about what is the environment, um, especially in an Antarctic context where it's so sharpened, where you have to ask, what do we have to bring in and out? Um, yeah, so. Thanks, Sandro. Um, there's a question now from Ruth. Thanks so much, Sandro, and, and thanks, Katie. Um, and thank you, Karen, as well. Um, I'm really, you know, fascinated with this research, um, as you know, and I know we've sort of um, talked a little bit offline about um, comparable figures, um, contemporaries like Joanne Simpson in um, tropical meteorology, who, um, as far as I understand, was very, uh, I suppose, um, quite aware of her significance as a soul woman in in that space and then took great effort to um, curate, I guess, her archive. And I was wondering whether you see anything similar with, um, with is it McWinnie? Pardon me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I think part of the difficulty with McWinnie is she died uh, sort of age 58, um, you know, several pack a day a smoker, it seems. Um, so, you know, got lung cancer and died fairly quickly, I think by what I can tell from her records is that the diagnosis was about a year before she died. So in a sense, she didn't have the chance. And I think the collection that does exist at DePaul was partly curated from um, donations from her 
I think her only PhD student, and her sister happened to also be a biologist at DePaul. I don't know exactly how that happened. Um, I think, I suppose it's perhaps less about the environment and just more the general kind of questions about women, uh, women in, this, in the 60s and 70s rising to seen seniority within these ranks and how they may have behaved or thought they should behave. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that answer, but um, she's not as self. Uh, she's not so self-reflexive in her letters. There's only a few moments in which she um, is very explicit about the sort of abrasive characters she can come up against. Um, she's kind of a gossip, like her letters. I mean, she makes certain. Um, imputations about the nun during winter. Um, she, you know, she, she's, you know, there's a married couple in the late seventies on the ship, the sort of young German married couple who she says sort of negative things about, um, partly about the wife who's in a sense is the suffering one in that relationship. Um, yeah. So she's an interesting figure and I'm trying to work out as well how her, kind of apparent religiosity comes into this. I'm not sure, but. Thanks, any other questions for Sandra? I've got one, Sandra, if I can take the chair's privilege then, because I'm, I'm just wondering whether part of what you're getting at towards the end with your kind of questions for us is that that maybe gender as a category actually has limited um, purchase in this context of um, the Antarctic, but that, that feminist theoretical frameworks and contributions have a huge amount to add. So that actually kind of separating those things out, which also it kind of like seems like, how can you do that? But actually it seems to me that what you're suggesting is that this maybe is a place where, where you could. Am I, am I hearing you right? Uh, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that I haven't done sufficient work to be able to answer the substantive question mm -hmm. as well as I might. Um, that sort of for my own way of working, that I think it is, for my sort of thought processes, I think it is important to separate, but not, you know, completely those two things. Um, but it is, I suppose, for me, it's a moment of self-reflection. And maybe it is for others working in this area that there are these inherited, I mean, there are so, there is so, it's sort of constitutive of the entire modern environmental humanities, that they sort of born in feminist scholarship, Haraway, seeing many others. Um, and so do we need to think back um, and back, partly ask why is gender therefore so not so apparent as a theme of scholarship? Um, you know, yeah, it's interesting, you know, in the last 20 years, Haraway's work is not centrally about gender. Um, she sort of has taken the human as a more encompassing category um yeah i think but i think to answer your specific question i think it's partly because i just i'm not at that stage of my research to be able to make a more confident statement about what does gender mean in antarctica apart from the obvious i mean um i want to get beyond the obvious i hope yeah yeah okay let's open up questions for um either karen or uh sandro so eve has a question eve Oh, I also had a question for Sandro, though I also really enjoyed Karen's paper. Um, I suppose I was wondering, you know, you mentioned, like I, I was interested in the way in which um, Mary Alice kind of um, performed her gender um, in professional context. And you mentioned the way in which she used initials, um, you know, in her publications to kind of, you know, create this kind of illusion of androgyny or masculinity. I suppose I was wondering if you have any evidence about the way in which she like performed her femininity or not in a kind of more embodied sense. I mean, just in terms of her, you know, her hairstyle, her dress and so on. And, you know, whether, 
that differed when she was in the highly masculinized space of the Antarctic stations or not? I only, so far I only had limited evidence and I'm trying to sort of think um, in an analog way with others work and practices on board ship and at stations at the time. I think the, the basic answer is that she wore sort of, um, you know, standard issue uh, defence military uh, clothing while she was at McMurdo, so because it's run by the Navy at the time. And on board the ship, um, you know, she's wearing sensible, you know, she's on deck in the Southern Ocean, dredging up krill. It's, you know, it's very wet and dirty work. So, you know, like others, she's wearing, you know, sensible, you know, deck shoes, you know, waterproof gear, that kind of stuff. Um, she is not, again, she is not overly descriptive or reflexive about her bodily state in her letters to colleagues. Um, yeah, so I, I really, it's something I'm trying to get at, um, but without so much success so far. Yeah, which is the kind of, I think, can be a perennial challenge when you're writing, you know, a professional biography of someone who is quite a reticent, you know, quite reticent about their personal life. But I mean, so just to quickly, the other point might be to add um, that we can often imagine Antarctic work to be incredibly difficult for the body, but in the middle of winter in a highly, in a perfectly heated building, you know, she's fine. Like, you know, people living in that context are, they're warm and toasty. It is cold outside. I mean, there's interesting like work. Melbourne right now. Just, things, <laughs> like, just like Melbourne right now. Um, you know, there's interesting ways some scholarship has contrasted these sort of ideologies of base life. So, you know, the Soviets were very much of why would we send our workers to Antarctica to suffer in the cold? Of course they need perfect beds and bedrooms and perfect heating and saunas. Like, of course. Whereas the British are like, no, you get the shitty shack without, you know, heating. Like, you have to suffer like a man. So there are ways in which the bases are um, do reflect certain ideologies about labour or, or gender. Mm. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Other questions for Karen or for uh, Sandro? I have a question for Karen then. Um, I can't believe I've never really thought to ask you this before, Karen, but um, there were four photographs taken of Joan. Three of them basically were of her in a, in a domestic or semi-domestic setting. And there was one, at least of the ones surviving, and there was one of her, which was the one that they chose, um, of her on the tractor. And it's, it's really striking, actually, when you think about that, that, that actually the photographer was probably expecting that it was a photograph of her in a domestic setting that they were wanting not one of her on the tractor. Um, and that was his assumptions in, in, all, in the shots that he took. I don't know whether you want to comment on that or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I think certainly uh, there's, there's actually a few other extra photos too that I didn't show, but they all, as you say, they're all, um, there's more of, of, um, of Joan inside with her mother uh, looking through, a, through a, a book of recipes, I think one of them shows. So yes, it, it, there, there is that. Um, I, I didn't have time there. There's, there's also a sort of a, a niggling thought in my head around the positioning on the tractor. And um, I, I did a little bit of work looking at posters of the the world of uh, the um, women's land army and there's a particular image that was promoted um, of, a, of a woman on a tractor in a, in a actually very similar pose to the one that uh, that Joan is in uh, so I wondered a little bit about whether there was some deliberate um, positioning going on or the way he framed that to to sort of echo those earlier those early images um, the women's land army being, you know, seen as this this labour force that would um, that, that would help men navigate this shortfall of labour, and you know whether that's still still the the message that they're they're wanting to 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 promote. Um, 
uh, Joan herself in the interview, in my interview, really interestingly, is just completely, she says she was completely shocked when they, when that's the image that appeared in the papers. She says, I was in my overalls, you know, they, they, they photographed me in my overalls and this is what appeared. So I think in her mind, there was still this, this sense that, um, that, that women, uh, you know, should be in a dress or um, be, be not presented in, on a tractor. So she herself saw it as, um, as quite shocking that that's, that's the image that then got plastered all, all over the, the newspapers and, and then in, in the poster for the Royal Melbourne show. Thanks, Karen. Last chance for questions. Eve has a question, yep. But I'll, if anyone else, I've already had a question, so if anyone else wants to ask, I'll feed to them. Um, I, you won't be surprised to know, Karen, that I um, was really interested in her Jones visit to the US um, because, you know, I, you know, I've done a bigger study of Australian women who went to the US in a similar time period and, you know, they have that same refrain that, you know, the US is the future, it's more modern, more sophisticated, um, you know, which you said that Joan very much had. I was wondering if she tried to kind of import any and um, sort of dis, dis, um, disperse any kind of American ideas about farming when she came back to Australia? Unfortunately, uh, Joan has been a wonderful, um, she's a wonderful archivist. She's kept uh, all, her, all her letters and her mother's letters and her, um, her mother kept a diary for, for very many years. She doesn't actually have, so she said she went on um, this sort of speaking tour and she, she spoke to a range of different community groups throughout Victoria and also in Tasmania. Um, so I was, when I went to visit her the second time, I was really keen to see whether she had the transcripts of any of those, um, those talks that she gave, because I think that that would probably, that would have given an insight into the types of um, innovation she thought you know, she should be, that America, that perhaps Australia should be embracing. None of those survived. And so I was just going on, on what she could remember. Her, her overall sort of um, memory of, of what she came back with was this, um, the mechanisation, you know, that she felt that they were way ahead of, of Australia in terms of embracing modern machinery. And, and if we, if, if more, um, if farmers could embrace this modern machinery, then they could farm more land, um, they, they could um, produce more food, you know, there's this sense of producing more food for the, the growing population of the world. Uh, so it's that, I think it was that sort of thing that she could remember. Um, of course, you know, as I said, within a decade or so, she was, had, had grave doubts about that, that approach. But um, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, I, I don't have to have any transcripts of what she actually came back with. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if we have no other questions, it is we're past time to um, wind up our seminar. But for our first Zoom seminar, I think we can say that this has been a fantastic success. Not only have we had people from all over the place, um, but actually we've had two really rich, really thought-provoking papers that I think have have demonstrated just how much work and there has been done already in the in the gender and environmental history field but also how much more there is to do from two fabulous early career researchers who are making wonderful contributions to that work and changing the way we think about the relationship between gender and environmental history so i thank you both karen and alessandro very much for your um your papers and the thoughtfulness and thought for broke thought-provoking nature of them both. And uh, a reminder that our next seminar is looking at parenthood. We have Carla Pascoe-Lay, who's with us tonight also, um, talking and Al Thompson from Monash University. So that is, I think, on the 1st of September, Tuesday the 1st, the first weekend, first Tuesday of September. We'll see you all back there, same time, same place, as it were. Look out for the Zoom link and um, look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks so much. Hi. Ah, there's Pat. Hi, Pat. <laughs> <laughs>
see you, Eve. See you. Bye.